The complexities of history are not usually amenable to sweeping characterization. Sure, we can, should, and can hardly help sequencing the snapshots of the past into one free-flowing, thematically unified motion picture. And any account of history that invites us to stare unflinchingly at the unsightly body hair of human savagery, butchery, and just general stupidity will always prove, for me, to be a perspective-bestowing exercise in humility. But an honest and rigorous look at any given historical moment is hardly ever to disentangle with Boy Scout's dexterity some elegantly prepared bow. More often, the pioneering historian finds himself plucking frustratingly at a Gordian knot of overlapping, competing, and sometimes contradictory notions of what really happened, what might have happened, and what lessons we are to scavenge from the ruins. Thus, any account of what one sees inside history's fog, beyond the glossy-eyed recitation of brute fact, must be formulated with utmost care and tends to result in statements whose hedges have hedges. But one would probably court little controversy in claiming that there's hardly any decade in American history more pubescent than the 1960s. Hippie counterculture, the war on poverty, the Vietnam War protests, the civil rights movement, the rise of environmental awareness, the space race, the beginnings of the gay rights movement, a wave of feminism that has since devolved into a lobotomized parody of itself, one could spout off Wikipedia subheadings all the live long day. Any given article on the historical significance of the decade is likely to do more justice to the details than I, and whether you view the changes wrought during the 60s as necessary growing pains or the end of a golden age is largely going to depend both on which issues you discuss and on your present day politics. And I'll be honest, I'm biased toward any decade that brings with it my beloved Rod Serling. But there's little doubting that the conflagration that currently rages in American political discourse was, in very large part, sparked and stoked here. And so it's theoretically possible that in late 1963, when Bob Dylan went to pen his anthemic The Times They Are a Changin', that he wasn't anticipating all the meteoric social shifts that would unfold over the remainder of the decade. It's also theoretically possible that all of the empty space and all of the wrong atoms will spontaneously align, causing Bob Dylan's cat to live the rest of her life as some unholy melding of feline and beanbag. How best to sequence the snapshots of the decade into one free-flowing thematically unified motion picture will forever be a matter of debate. But quite separate from the question of his intentions, it's hard to imagine any variation of the resultant film in which Dylan's nasally eloquence and signature harmonica aren't conversing triumphantly yet ominously in the background. Still, if some Krypton-level extinction event were to suddenly befall humankind, preserving the song itself but wiping away all traces of the surrounding cultural context, it would be difficult for even the most sagacious of the surviving scholars to learn anything from it about the deepest hopes and fears of 1960s America. Because the song's underlying architecture is designed for shifting sands and foretells the seismic shifts that were to come in vague, Nostradamus-like prognostications, your remarkably lifelike replica of the Volkswagen Type 2 is probably the better fit for your 60s time capsule. In fact, let your ears linger on the lyrics for but a moment, and you'll be swiftly struck with the sensation that times seems much older than a mere half-century. The song is written in the fine colloquial English we expect of Dylan, and I suspect his plain but profound lyrical style had something to do with his 2016 Nobel Prize. Like several of his other songs, time's underlying rhetorical structure is that of a language both ancient and foreign. In this case, the prophetic and poetic stylings of the late biblical prophets, particularly that of Isaiah. If your mental prototype of a prophet is that of a divinely appointed tattletale passing smugly through the city gates right as the fireballs come hurling out of the sky, then biblical prophecy and social protest might seem a strange pair of topics to yoke together, kind of like feminist glaciology. 
To conclude this too hastily, though, is to fail to realize that Isaiah and the so-called later prophets are cut from quite a different cloth than Abraham or Moses. The book of Jonah provided us with a useful frame of reference in our Sound of Silence analysis, and Isaiah will serve much the same function here. As a bit of background, Isaiah is the most famous of the later prophets, a collection of prophetic and poetic works situated right before the New Testament. Isaiah speaks for a god a great deal more class conscious than the conquering warlord found in much of the rest of the Old Testament. Isaiah's rhetorical fire and brimstone is hurled at a priesthood spiritually compromised by empty ritual, and his prophetic prowess is pressed into the service of the widow and the orphan. With the Assyrian conquest of Israel's northern kingdom and exile to Babylon looming in its future, God's chosen people were facing some uncertain times. We can think of Isaiah as a kind of anti-establishment voice, or rather voices, amidst the chaos. And for Isaiah, Israel fixing its gaze on society's most vulnerable was tantamount to reverting its eyes back to God. Adam Potke, who also, however briefly, notes the thematic parallels between Isaiah and the 60s folk movement as a whole, tells us that scholars generally break the book of Isaiah into four interlocking topics, which, by turns, map neatly onto and contrast interestingly with Dylan's prophetic speaker. In Potke's words, these are the call for repentance, the denunciation of bad religion and social injustice, the announcement of imminent destruction, and the promise of future restoration. These topics will help keep us afloat as we wind our way through a text rather dense with metaphors. But since Dylan's treatment of his times is more abstract and philosophical than political or spiritual, we'll stay focused on larger, more universal concerns. We could very easily devote all of our exegetical energies to speculating on what events Dylan might have been foretelling in this or that line, but where is the fun or the relevance in that? We'll instead focus on how the song's layers of metaphorical representation embody the highly abstract concept of change in a way that makes it easier for us to grasp. This is a mouthful, I know, but it'll become clearer as we look closely at and make connections between each verse. From there, we'll consider the extent to which this prophet's words can speak even to our own turbulent times. Let's start by establishing how the speaker situates himself and his listeners within the flux of his own fictional space. Come gather round people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Oh, then you better start swimming on your sink like a stone For the times, they are a-changing As abstract as the song gets later on, verse 1 makes it pretty easy to get a handle on the relationship between speaker and listener or rather, prophet and assembly, as the biblical archetypal backdrop of the world-ending flood infuses the rhetorical situation with a prophetic urgency well beyond that of your typical Sunday morning church service. The message, like Isaiah's, is fairly straightforward. Bad things are happening and will continue to happen unless and until you do something about it. Since God and or the supernatural plays no obvious role in these apocalyptic proceedings, this prophet's call for repentance has little to do with the rending of garments and the donning of sackcloth, but the get with the program sense of the phrase remains nevertheless intact. And though the imagery is not as dramatic as Isaiah's, there's certainly enough here to count as an announcement of imminent, if metaphorical, destruction. It also seems that this is a message that we, the audience beyond the reach of this fictional flood, are meant to participate in. What it might mean for us to start swimming, however, remains a mystery. So let's see if verse 2's metaphorical cataclysms can help provide some interpretive buoyancy. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin And 
And there's no telling who that it's naming For the loser now will be later to win For the times they are a-changing Just in case we were tempted to read the speaker as a kind of primitive meteorologist who's just a little slow on the uptake, verse 2 makes it clear that Prophet is in fact his self-identification. Who else but a self-styled soothsayer would feel qualified to advise those who prophesize with their pens to keep their eyes wide, not speak too soon, and to assure all who are listening that today's losers will be tomorrow's winners? More tellingly, though, the speaker conceives of change as a kind of zero-sum game, not unlike roulette. For most of us, the flood in verse 1 invokes little more than the destructive potential of change. The more archetypally savvy might note that floods are symbolic of the cyclical nature of destruction and restoration, which, if read this way, would at least have a little more of this built into it. But a will that names losers and winners seems to me even more freighted with unsavory implications. The typically biblical paradigm presented in Isaiah, by way of comparison, is that of a God who rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And the problems with such a proposition are among the first raised by Western philosophers. But the idea that those who stand triumphantly upon history's peaks, and those who languish in its valleys, are placed there at the whim of a spinning wheel, seems hardly less arbitrary than divine mandate. What is to the prophet the decree of heaven, and to the physicist the product of blind causation, can only fall within the chaotic domain of dumb luck to those of us on the ground. Much to the chagrin of those who view history as spiraling ever upward toward utopia, the speaker has left no clear indication here that the winners deserve to win and the losers deserve to lose. In stark contrast to Isaiah, Dylan's prophetic speaker seems to present an amoral, almost Machiavellian picture of history in the sense that he seems far more concerned with what is true rather than what ought to be true. Such a ruthlessly pragmatic view of the world would have us gauge which way the wind is blowing and adjust ourselves accordingly, regardless of how many endangered species are eviscerated beneath the hull. Let's see what's in verse 3 before all this shameless hyperbole gives way to overreading. Come, senators, congressmen, Please heed the call Don't stand in the doorway Don't block up the hall For he that gets hurt Will be he who has stalled There's a battle outside And it's raging Oh, and it'll soon shake your windows And rattle your walls For the times they are a-change Verse 3 contains heavier political overtones, with our prophet speaking truth to power. We start with this nice democratic ideal where politicians are subject to some authority beyond themselves, to a call which must be heeded, to a force which must remain unimpeded. Forgive me, you know I can only go so long before I gotta spit them rhymes. Anyway, this seems to me to loosely align with what we take the political process to be. But the metaphors continue to emphasize change as an amoral, arbitrary, and destructive force. Change is presented as a kind of running with the bulls in which he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. Thus the strangely out-of-place pleas we find here and in verse 4 is less about humble supplication or even politeness and more about the kind of urgency you want to summon when you see, say, someone about to be sodomized by the horn of an angry bull. Next we have a nifty little metaphor in which the status quo is conceived as a house in the middle of a battlefield. And like the big bad wolf, change is huffing and puffing on that house, but there's still no indication that the political edifice deserves to come tumbling down and the fattened pigs inside devoured. 
considering how change has been represented thus far, and looking more closely at the implications of the metaphor. The status quo is the safe, structured, and stable element, while change is chaotic, disruptive, and dangerous. In other words, the speaker has given us no indication that the battle outside is being waged by freedom fighters, and that those ensconced within the structure are corrupt bureaucrats. Even in these cynical times when words like senators and congressmen are just as likely to call to mind thuggish complacency as dedicated civil service, such a connotation, now and in 1963, is far from inevitable. So this prophetic project remains more descriptive than prescriptive. But the prophet isn't finished, so let's take a look at the remaining two verses before we consider the larger takeaway. From mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand your sons and your daughters are beyond your command your old road is rapidly aging please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are a change The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast The slow one now, will it up be fast As the present now, will it up be past The order is rapidly fading And the first one now, will later up be last for the times, they are a-changing. Verse 4 deals with the concept of change in intergenerational terms. And though we do finally see the vaguest intimation of future restoration, this is about as close as the speaker is going to get to the denunciation of bad religion and social injustice, which is to say, not close at all. The sense of imperative is strongest here than anywhere else, but there's really no indication, and certainly no guarantee, that the new road will somehow pave over poverty, injustice, inequality, or any of the other stated grievances that social revolutions are meant to redress. Like in verse 3, the prophet's message is directed more narrowly, but this time he shines the spotlight on mothers and fathers, making it clear that they shouldn't criticize what they can't understand. But this doesn't necessarily imply that the sons and daughters somehow have more understanding, just that they aren't the ones criticizing. And the message is not that the previous generation should gleefully disengage the parental locks out of some great moral imperative, but that their children are already neck deep in the kinkiest porn sites. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Given the rest of the song, the implication is not so much lend your hand to the laying of the yellow brick road as get out of the way if you don't want to be steamrolled. My weakness for metaphors that allow me to make liberal use of the blood spatter effect notwithstanding, I don't believe this to be overstatement given the change equals destruction conceptual metaphor the speaker's been tapping and continues to tap in verse 5. We'd be steamrolling a dead horse if we were to examine every line in detail here, but there are a few features worth pointing out. In addition to revisiting the changes war metaphor with the suggestion of battle lines, and continuing to lend prophetic gravity to his words by directly plagiarizing the very paragon of the social justice prophets, the speaker now describes change as a curse. I mean, think about how easy it would have been to put the much nicer sounding word spell here instead. And when the order fades, what is to take its place? Disorder? If all we had to go on was the text itself, we would be forgiven for assuming that time's prophet is as gleeful in his anticipation of the apocalypse as any alien worshipping doomsday cult. And if it weren't for the fact that context is key, and that this is doubly the case when considering a period as culturally charged as the 60s, then the Bible's more socially conscious doomsayers oriented as they are within a zeitgeist of social and political unrest, would seem poor points of comparison. 
conceiving of the text purely as a piece of political rhetoric, you'd be right to argue that the artistic milieu in which Dylan got his start largely appealed to those all aboard the social progress train. And though the fictional speaker within the text is clearly prophesying the downfall of some conservative establishment to that very establishment, the target audience in the real world seems to be those who would have relished the idea of racist, sexists, and other reactionaries tied helplessly to the tracks. Take this for granted, and the fact that all this doom and gloom is presented as if it were the contents of an Irish drinking song makes all the sense in the world. The only apocalypse worth celebrating, in other words, is the one that's about to befall your enemies. But social progressivism in any of its forms, far from emanating out of the text, is a perspective which must, in the final analysis, be read into it. How hard is it, in a song with this much metaphorical richness, to throw a line or two in there that really cinches the idea that the golden age is just over the horizon? Come on, Bobby. Tell me the pupa of progress is not the most beautiful metaphor you've ever laid ears on. No? Okay, I'll see myself out. The point is that there is a world of difference between telling someone that they should embrace change because it is good and telling them that they should embrace it because it is inevitable. It's the difference between taking up arms and driving out the godless Assyrians and preemptively enrolling in the Assyrian Language Training Academy. Goodness and inevitability aren't mutually exclusive, of course. We can have change that is both good and inevitable. The German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel certainly saw the two as inherently entwined. And it's Hegel that provides us with some useful concepts as we consider time's larger philosophical takeaway. But first, a brief aside. I've talked extensively in other videos about how the tropes of foundational religious texts can infuse an otherwise secular message with otherworldly power, and I don't intend to repeat myself here since Dylan's text leaves us with much the same effect. What is more interesting in times is the tension between text and context, or more specifically, the tension between the literary context and the socio-cultural slash historical context. Consider for but a moment the very nature of a protest song, and you'll see that the bedrock axiom of such a work is that when it comes to positive social change, people are at the helm rather than under the hull. But if the times are simply going to proceed ominously down whatever course fate has charted, as Dylan's speaker repeatedly suggests, and by all means look back through the lyrics if you don't want to take my word for it, then what, after all, could be the point of protesting anything? To protest is to implicitly claim moral high ground that transcends whatever form social structures happen to take at a given time. As far as I can tell, there is no clear moral stance on the part of Dylan's speaker. Most of these lyrics could occupy the banners of peaceful protesters, bloodthirsty revolutionaries, or jackbooted death squads without any obvious contradictions. Or to put it in terms that I'm sure many on YouTube will understand, social justice warriors and Kekistanians alike could each gleefully prophesy the other's collapse into obsolescence with any given verse of this song. Provided we have an in-group that stands to gain from a prospective political reshuffling, or even the perception thereof, it's hard to imagine a creed that couldn't comfortably commandeer times as a holy scripture. In fact, when an artificial superintelligence finally converts us all into organic batteries, I can think of no background music more fitting. It's when we take seriously the ideological and moral fungibility of the prophet's words that Hegelian philosophy starts to provide us with some useful vocabulary. To attempt to condense the work of any philosopher into a few key concepts is to inevitably oversimplify, so I encourage you to go check out a good summary of Hegel on your own if you're so inclined. Nerd. But I'm under no illusion that I'm providing anything other than the Hegel bites here. So Hegel saw history's movement as a dialectic. The antithesis, or new order, broadly speaking, would react against the thesis, or old order, and the two would engage in a kind of tug of war until a balance emerged which synthesized the best qualities of both. The process would then start over again, with the human experiment inching ever closer to a perfect synthesis of history's superlatives. Whether they know it or not, anyone who gloats that they are on the right side of history is working from a Hegelian assumption that history is moving upward just by moving forward. 
If this doesn't strike you as an accurate model of humanity's historical trajectory, that's okay. The point is that Hegel at least proffers a mechanism for how humanity might lurch slowly in progress's general direction. This sense of progress is, depending on how you look at it, either deeply taken for granted by, or just altogether absent from, the times they are a changing. There is no thesis to vilify, no antithesis to celebrate, and no great synthesis to hope for. Our prophet is a faceless, featureless, amoral commentator of a wrestling match between two faceless, featureless, amoral competitors. All we know is that one is violently subduing the other, one will come out on top, and that we best shift our bets over to the impending victor. But make no mistake, you'll be hard-pressed to locate in this text an Isaiah-style assurance that good will eventually triumph over evil. As I see it, we are left with two ways to interpret the text as a whole. Taking the prophet at his word, we are exhorted to act as moral chameleons, our colors shifting with the edicts of the times, a prospect that is fatalistic at best and nihilistic at worst. I don't think it too bold of me to suggest that this is the less traveled of the two interpretive routes. Few can seriously entertain the prospect of living and acting in the world, divorced of any sense of transcendent values. Nihilism is not so much a position as a posture, and not one any sane person can maintain for very long at that. And though it is a kind of ethic, few besides warlords and supervillains take might makes right to be an actionable moral philosophy. Adapt or perish is indeed what is being put forth, but this seems to me to be the least practical level of analysis. It might very well be the most literal, but it isn't the moral strata in which most of us live. No, I think the temptation to frame the text within some set of values is by far the stronger impulse. And doing our homework, we should of course attempt to calibrate our ears to some loose approximation of the song's original milieu. And it's in doing so that we see just how powerfully the song can resonate with those of us who see the prophet as speaking for our side, who see ourselves as helping to orchestrate in our own small way some virtuous coup d'etat, and to ultimately see ourselves within the great cosmic struggle as fighting on the side of the good. But the real value of the analysis emerges the moment we discover how nastily these celebratory sentiments of our enemy's imminent destruction sit on the tongue, and that maybe, just maybe, we'll realize the irony of climbing inside the cockpit of a Decepticon that collapses neatly into a hippie van. While maintaining that the silly postmodern idea that any text can be interpreted any old which way is something that any lover of deep reading and deep thinking should reject, the genius of this particular text nevertheless lies in Dylan's ability to get out of the reader's way. Time's great paradox is that we get the prophecy without the preaching. But in marrying the notions of change and chaos, the prophet, perhaps despite the intentions of his creator, has ended up decoupling the notions of change and progress, hopefully prompting us to envision, with a bit more discipline, the kind of world in which we can all be happy to call ourselves conservative. That is all I have to say, but certainly not all that can be said. What have I oversimplified, overcomplicated, or left out altogether? In what ways do other 60s folk or rock artists, or other Bob Dylan songs for that matter, merge prophecy with protest? Join me next time as we throw out the prophecy, but keep the protest with a close look at CCR's Fortunate Son. Let me know all I've missed in the comments below, and please be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more in-depth song analysis. This is Professor Chase. Hope to see you next lesson. I took my love, I took it down Climbed a mountain and I turned around and I saw my reflection in the snow-covered hills Till the landslide brought me down Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Can the child within my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing? Ocean tides Can I handle the seasons Of 
Down. 